Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Now, if I could only ever eat one meal for the rest of my life, it would be chicken tikka balti with mushroom pilau rice and a stack of chapatis from Bengal Spice on Station Road in Redcar. If I could only drink one alcoholic drink for the rest of my life, it would be a pint of Theakston's Best Bitter. And if I could only listen to one genre of music for the rest of my days, it would be sleazy, dirty, howling, wailing, electric blues guitar. And I'm going to take you through my five favourite albums in that genre in this video. And it's just actually occurred to me the most bizarre thing. You know, there are plenty of YouTube guitarists out there who are name-dropping Line 6 or Fender or Seymour Duncan or Marshall or whatever, you know, maybe in the hope of getting an endorsement deal and who do I open the video with a plug for the local curry house and brewery, which I think says a lot about me, doesn't it? Anyway, let's crack on with the first one on the list. Okay, Layla and other assorted love songs by Derek and the Dominoes. Um... How I got into this album is, well, I started playing the guitar in 1978 when I looked a bit like this. Um, difficult to say which is the more embarrassing haircut, really, isn't it? That one or the one I've got now. But uh, back then there was um, a local current affairs show on TV. I think it was called Coast to Coast. It was just on the local uh, regional channel around here. And they used Layla as the uh, theme tune for that uh, for that show just the first 20 seconds or so of it and that blew me away it was just i'd never heard anything quite so electrifying not since i'd first heard hank marvin way back when i was a toddler um anyway cut a long story short i went to uh the local branch of wh smith's i think it was um clutching me pocket money that i'd saved up and bought the album uh layla and other assorted love songs and of course you know I, I spent a long time just listening to that one track as you tend to do at that age you kind of want to hear it again and again and again when i when i first started then exploring the rest of the album there was this incredible music on there uh tunes like nobody knows you when you're down and out any day have you ever loved a woman or the my, my favorite one off that whole album key to the highway it's there's a a looseness and a tightness that pervades the whole album the looseness is probably a result of the brandy and heroin that eric clapton was fueled by at the time and but there's a tightness there in the fact that you can you can almost feel the eye contact uh, going on between the, the, the different musicians in the room and that you can feel they're all kind of uh, playing as one unit. And uh, Paul Gambaccini um, mentioned uh, a while ago in an interview that there's a certain moment in certain songs where the, the people in the room who are playing that suddenly kind of realise that they're part of something special that's going to you know it's going to be more than just another recording session and this is going to kind of have some uh, traction long term and I definitely think you can hear that in this whole album um, Eric Clapton often talks about that uh, Robert Johnson compilation the collected works of Robert Johnson as being the album that really switched him on to blues and kind of set him on the path uh, to the rest of his life well, for me, that album is Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs. Thanks, Eric. Yes, Talk to Your Daughter by Robin Ford. Now, this is a prime example of how I, and I suspect a lot of other people, used to discover new music back in the olden days of the 1980s. It wasn't uncommon back then to go out and buy an album by someone you'd never previously heard of, and certainly whose music you'd never heard, but you had read about them. Okay, and that was enough of a clue sometimes to get you to go out and part with your money. And that's how I discovered Robin Ford. I heard about him, or read about him rather, in the pages of Guitar Player magazine when they were talking about this new album that he brought out, which was a return to his blues roots, uh, called the album was obviously Talk to Your Daughter. 
and uh, you know it was kind of very bluesy with kind of a strong rock sensibility in there but there was a lot of kind of jazz harmony and sophistication and that really did kind of prick my ears up and make me think "Mm, must check that out problem was that you go to your local record shop I think I used to buy most of my um, music in Woolworths at the time you know or it might have been uh, WH Smith you just didn't see these kind of albums on the shelves in there it was always you know Tina Turner Terence Trent Darby Depeche Mode Swing Out Sister Curiosity Killed the Cat and you know other such luminaries from the 1980s music scene but I ended up quite by accident discovering one of his albums, well, this album, in, I think it was in Our Price Records in Middlesbrough. I'm a big lad, I'm six foot seven, and have been for quite a while, you know. So it's, uh, you kind of get into the habit of peering over people's shoulders a lot of the time, you know, just because you're being nosy, basically. And I was seeing somebody kind of flicking through the albums at the vinyl, and um, I saw the album cover for Talk To Your Daughter, and immediately I'm thinking, please don't buy that album, please don't buy that album, I bet they haven't got another one, please don't buy that copy of that album, and fortunately they didn't, I didn't quite have to elbow people out of the way, but I did sort of dive on it, and um, was, you know, I I still vividly remember the bus ride home, uh, reading the album kind of sleeve, and you know, kind of just full of that uh, anticipation and curiosity what this is going to sound like, and... Well, it didn't disappoint. I mean, there are so many great tracks on that album. Um, You know, Born Under a Bad Sign, um, Ain't Got Nothing But The Blues, uh, the title track itself, Talk To Your Daughter, big, chunky-sounding kind of guitar sounds. Very 80s production on that album, you know, with, with the big guitar sounds, but still inherently bluesy. And if there's one track on there that really blew me away, it's an instrumental called Revelation. It's the track that really made me realise that blues could be complex without kind of becoming just out and out jazz, which I don't think I was quite ready for at the time. But I I did like a bit of blues, and this was a very bluesy tune, but it had complex harmony in there, and it it really opened my horizons uh, to new styles of blues. Thanks, Robin. Okay, the Allman Brothers at the Fillmore East. Um... How I got into this album was a a bit sort of haphazard, really. Uh, I was traipsing around the local branch of Tesco or Safeway or whatever supermarket I was in at the time. And uh, happened to go down the music aisle and they had one of these discount bins full of clearance stuff. And there was uh, like a blues compilation album in in this bin and it was just all sort of tracks by the likes of chicken shack and taj mahal and george thorogood and stuff but the name that uh, that really piqued my interest on the on the back of the cd was uh, the allman brothers band uh i thought i know the allman brothers band i didn't realize they were a blues band because frankly all i knew about them up to that point was you know that tune jessica which is used as the theme for top gear and uh didn't know they did blues. Let's let's check that out. So got the album home and realised that these tr- two tracks that were on there, Statesboro Blues and Stormy Monday, uh, they, they were obviously live. So I thought, well, I bet there's a live album with these on. So I uh, pootled off down to um, the place in Middlesbrough where you go to if you want to buy some kind of unusual records, Alan Fernley's on Linthorpe Road, long since closed down, I'm afraid to say. And, um, yeah, I I had to order it, and, um, again, it's that sense of anticipation, isn't it? It's like waiting for Christmas. Finally got the phone call a couple of weeks later that uh, your album's come in, and um, got it home, listened to it, and was absolutely blown away. I, I don't think I'd ever heard music that sounded as fluent as this. Of course, I'd had my my appetite whetted by the two tracks on that uh, blues compilation album but just listening to that album as a whole it's just a it's a transcendental experience it is a brilliantly beautiful album the music on there is so fluent and full of energy and life and emotion if you haven't heard the album i i can't imagine there's many of you out there watching this video that haven't heard it but you know if you haven't listened to it in a while go and listen to it again now it it's just a fantastic album i've never seen any footage i don't know if any footage exists of the gigs that uh were 
um, you know, the source material for this live album. But I feel like every time I, I, I listen to the album, I'm watching a, a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray version of it. It's so strong is the, uh, the the power of that album to conjure up mental imagery. It's a fantastic album and I love it. So that's all I've got to say on that one. Next. <laughs> So, Showdown by Albert Collins, Robert Cray and Johnny Copeland. Uh, This album came out in 1985 and I didn't really discover it then. Uh, But what did also happen in 1985 was Live Aid. And people talk about Queen's performance being the the kind of standout performance from that day. And yeah, I've got to admit, it was a fantastic uh, performance by Queen. But a large part of my memory of that day is the George Thorogood and the Destroyers set from, I think it was uh, the, the, the US half of Live Aid. And George invited a special guest artist on stage uh, to come and jam with them. This wild, wide-eyed um, blues guitarist who um, had a Telecaster slung over the wrong shoulder, I seem to recall, and he played like a man possessed. He was just like this ball of, of energy bouncing around the stage and, come, and and getting this amazing sound out of a Telecaster. And, you know, Albert Collins, for it was he, um, you know, he, he kind of stuck in my memory from that day. That's the first time I'd heard of him or heard him. And then my timeline might be a little bit mixed up here, but I was a big... Uh, viewer of a BBC show called The Old Grey Whistle Test around about that time as well. And um, they invited this new up-and-coming um, American blues guitarist to, to, into the studio to come and do a live set, Robert Cray. And again, never heard anything you know quite like it. It was like he was playing blues, but with Mark Knopfler's guitar sound, if you know what I mean. That, that was the, the initial impression that I made at the time. And boy, could he play, and could he ever sing as well. So, you know, a couple of years later, I think this is getting round to about 87, 88. Again, just a chance discovery in um, a local music shop, the kind of thing that you, you don't usually see in these shops. I uh, I discovered this album, Showdown. I didn't really know who Johnny Copeland was, but I knew who Albert... Collins and Robert Cray were and um, took it back on. I think that might have been one of the first CDs that I ever bought. Uh, it was certainly kind of round about that era when I'd got my first uh, CD player. Uh, took it home, absolutely blown away by it. If you don't know the album, check it out. It's called Showdown. If you're a fan of just good, old fashioned, honest to goodness, straight ahead, 12 bar blues, played exquisitely well, you're going to love that album. Next. And finally, we come to Couldn't Stand the Weather by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. Now, there is a lot of talk in uh, music circles about the difficult second album. And the, the basic idea is that, you know, a band or an artist has their entire life to come up with their first album and if it's great fine and uh, then they've got 12 months to come up with something equally as good for the second offering and that is why you know it is true that a lot of bands second albums aren't usually as strong as as their debuts that's not true with stevie though is it dear me couldn't stand the weather what a second album if anything I think he's he's grown and he's matured and it's a I just think it's a stronger album than Texas Flood. Texas Flood is great. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't have a word said against that, but if I had to pick uh, either of those two albums uh, to take to a desert island with me, it would be couldn't stand the weather. I mean just the opening bars of Scuttlebutt in that, you know, kind of if you if when you first hear those that that guitar riff at the beginning of that track if your jaw doesn't hit the floor, then there's something wrong with you, quite frankly. And, you know, the only criticism that uh, the critics, who love to criticise, I guess the clue is in the name, the only criticism that they came out with of, of this album at the time was that, the oh, well, there are too many cover versions on it. Pish. 
is what I say to that. Have you never come across the idea of a, of a standard? It's, it's there in, in jazz circles all the time. You know, um, how many jazz musicians have done Autumn Leaves, for example, or Stella by Starlight, or My Funny Valentine, etc., etc. You know, what's wrong with kind of doing your own reading of a, of a tune that's been uh, previously released? And it's, it's, your, it's a standard, you know. And, you know, the, probably the strongest cover version on that whole album is is what Stevie did to Jimmy's, Jimi Hendrix's uh, Voodoo Child. I'd not really been a big fan of Jimi Hendrix up, up to that point, largely because, you know, any time, any exposure you got to Jimi Hendrix on TV or, you know, wherever, back in the 70s when I was growing up, it was always just some wild hippie smashing a guitar or setting it on fire or standing in front of a, a towering wall of Marshall stacks generating a howling, wailing, screaming cacophony of feedback that you know was about as musical as a tomcat getting his bits chopped off so you know i didn't really get Jimi hendrix but then i heard voodoo child on stevie's uh, album and i thought hmm maybe i should go and check out some hendrix and listen again and check it out again and eventually you know i did get into Jimi hendrix via that uh that, that Stevie Ray Vaughan album so you know I'm eternally grateful to Stevie for opening that door for me uh, thank you very much so there you go there are my five favorite blues albums in no particular order whatsoever uh, there's probably another 500 that I could list uh, maybe some of you will, are a little bit surprised that I haven't mentioned Gary Moore's name once in this video. To be honest, I could do an entire video on my five favourite Gary Moore blues albums. So I just thought I'd kind of put those to one side for the moment. Okay, so that's pretty much it for today, folks. I do hope you've enjoyed the video. All of the links to all of the albums are all in the description box below, along with a couple of other things that uh, you will find out about at the end of the video. And uh, just news just in, really. Uh, well, I got the email the other day. The good people at Fret Zealot are quite impressed, it seems, with one of my Udemy courses, Play Lead Guitar the Easy Way, and they are doing some... Uh, content for their uh, fret zealot app that will enable you to kind of basically use the course with your fret zealot um you know kind of system that you can put onto your guitar uh, i'll link to the fret zealot website also in the description box below and uh, fret zealot are going to be sending me uh, a unit to try out so there'll be a review of that coming up at some point in the near future and i'll just take this opportunity to say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time uh if you've enjoyed the video please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell and why not give me a like while you're at it and i do look forward to seeing you all again next time around bye for now folks and don't forget before you go to check out my udemy courses which you can see are available via my website which is also where you you can contact me to get in touch for some one-to-one -one tuition either via skype or in person if you live local to me i also have merchandise available on my teespring store and of course all of the links are in the description see you next time chaps